Hello. The topic for today is the uh, uh, an excerpt from the book What Makes uh, Right Acts Right uh, by a fellow by the name of W. D. Ross. Um, because it usually helps to know these sorts of things, this is uh, this is Sir William David Ross. Uh, is usually cited as W. D. Ross. Uh, he went by David. His most important book is a book called The Right and the Good, which uh, this today's reading is an excerpt from. Um, Another thing that uh, Ross did that was very important was uh, he was a very important translator of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, specifically his Nicomachean Ethics, which uh, if you decide to go online and you want to read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and you don't want to pay any money for it, uh, the W.D. Ross translation is uh, the, the most recent good translation that is public domain. Uh, and it's a very good translation. It's it's a completely readable. Um, uh, it's very well done. Uh, it was the scholarly standard Aristotle for for really quite a long time. Um, so in any case, that's that's what you'll look for if you want to read um, uh, the Nicomachean Ethics, which we'll cover a, a piece of later in this course. Uh, and he spent most of his professional career at Oxford. So the reading itself actually begins with a bit of an Oxford-Cambridge rivalry because he starts off by talking about a theory about ethics uh, that we don't really cover in this course, uh, but that is developed by uh, this fellow here. Uh, this is George Edward Moore. Um, uh, they were contemporaries. They were alive at the same time. They knew each other. Uh, it, it, actually, George Edward Moore uh, is, is usually cited as G.E. Moore, but he sort of hated his first names, George and Edward, never used them. Uh, his wife called him Bill. Uh, he had a, a very wide scope of publication. He was very influential in many different areas of philosophy. He was one of the one of the giants of the 20th century in terms of uh, philosophical work. Uh, but his most important work to ethics is a book called Principia Ethica. It's a, another sort of a big, big important book. Uh, and he spent most of his professional career at Cambridge. And it's it's his theory that W. D. Ross uh, starts off by responding to. And if you didn't really know anything about G. E. Moore or his theories, this is a part of the reading that you you know wouldn't. Uh, I think would be a little lost uh, about, so I'm trying, going to try and provide some necessary background here. Uh, so the theory that Ross starts off talking about, um, and I think he describes the theory perfectly well, so you wouldn't be completely lost or anything like that, uh, but the idea is what Moore calls ideal utilitarianism. And the short version of this view, uh, of this view of Moore's, uh, is that he accepts consequentialism, right? The idea that the only thing that matters in terms of morality is consequences. Uh, but he rejects hedonism, right? He rejects what's called classical utilitarianism. Uh, the kind of utilitarianism that we've covered in this course is what you would call classical utilitarianism. Uh, and if you'll recall, it's committed to the idea of consequentialism, optimificity, and hedonism, right? Um, what uh, uh, Moore does, uh, he says, it, he has this view uh, that that you know consequential and consequentialism and optimificity are just perfectly fine, uh, but it's hedonism that he rejects. Right? Uh, he thinks that uh, the right act is the one that is maximally productive of the good, uh, but we're, the way what the good is is not necessarily defined just in terms of pleasure or the absence of pain. Again, that's what classical utilitarianism held. Uh, ideal utilitarianism says, well, it's something else. And, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about what Moore thinks the good is, uh, but he doesn't think it's just pleasure in the absence of pain. So uh, Ross, though, uh, is going to depart from ideal utilitarianism uh, and, other, and every other form of utilitarianism uh, because he's going to state that he's, in some sense, a non-consequentialist. He'll state that very, fairly early in, in this work. Uh, and so he rejects classical utilitarianism uh, because he rejects hedonism. And so, so far, he and G.E. Moore are on the same page. They both think that hedonism is too narrow a view of, of, of well-being uh, to count as, as emblematic of the moral good. Um, but Ross is going to go a little bit further. Uh, he'll reject the, the very idea of consequentialism, right? The idea that the right-making characteristics of an action are its consequences. And so that's what makes him a non-consequentialist. He's a non-consequentialist because he rejects the idea that consequences are all that matters for morality. However, it becomes pretty clear as you read through the article that he doesn't have the view that consequences are always irrelevant, right? So uh, certainly consequences are going to be something that can be considered and they can be important to morality. It's just that they're not primarily what's important. Certainly they're not all that's important. And so Ross uh, is absolutely a non-consequentialist.
And so what Ross's theory is here, um, it, it, it starts to uh, be built up on this concept of a moral duty, right? Um, and uh, Ross believes that the moral point of view looks more to the past and the present uh, and very much uh, uh, less less to the future, right? This is something that consequentialists are always looking at the future to determine the moral status of actions. Non-consequentialists tend to look at the past or the present. This is one large scale difference between them. Ross uh, uh, sides with the non-consequentialists on this point. And so uh, what he says is that what is relevant uh, to what you ought to do is not what will happen as a result, but rather um, what your duty is in some case, which depends largely on facts about the past and present. And in fact, his rejection of, of consequentialism uh, comes with a very famous uh, passage of his. And this is uh, the one that's on uh, page 135 in the text. Uh, and it goes something like this. Um, uh, actually, no, this is on one, uh, 134, or 133, excuse me. Uh, he says, when a plain man fulfills a promise because he thinks he ought to do so, it seems clear that he does so with no thought of its total consequences, and still less with any opinion that these are likely to be the best possible. He thinks, in fact, much more of the past than of the future. What makes him think it right to act in a certain way is the fact that he has promised to do so. That, and usually, nothing more. That's the sort of commonsensical nature of Ross's uh, writing about ethics that has made him uh, enduringly famous uh, in the field. Uh, and you'll see that kind of uh, sort of common sensationness, if that's it, to coin a phrase. Um, uh, the, the phrase we use in, in, in ethics is called intuitionism, but you know, don't worry about that. It's common sensationness, right? We'll call it that. So um, what uh, uh, Ross here introduces is a notion he, he calls a the notion of a prima facie duty. Now you can say prima facie or prima facie or uh, prima facie. I, it doesn't really matter, okay? It's like corrupt medieval Latin anyway, and Latin's not a living spoken language anymore. So say it however you want, uh, and people will pretty much know what you mean. But the phrase uh, prima facie is, is a Latin phrase, um, and... and uh, We'll talk a little bit about that phrase in a second, but this is where Ross is going to part, depart very substantially from Kant. Okay, so if you remember in Kant's moral theory, moral duties are all categorically imperative, right? There, in fact, uh, Kant thinks there is one principle of moral duty, one principle of the moral law, which is the categorical imperative. Uh, for Ross, duties are not all categorically imperative. They're, that's not the way that morality is for Ross. Uh, for, for Ross, duties are prima, what he calls anyway, prima facie. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what he meant by that. And uh, uh, so the word, the phrase prima facie rather, means loosely uh, at first glance or on its face or something like that. Uh, it, it's an epistemological notion. That is, it's a notion about how what how we understand things or or what we understand. Uh, so, uh, a truly prima facie duty, right? If we're using that phrase as literally as possible, is a duty that looks at first like it's your duty, but turns out that it isn't, right? Um, and Ross himself actually expresses dissatisfaction with the term prima facie, but he used it because he just didn't think of a more appropriate term. In fact, if you take a look at, at, uh, at page 135, this is one of the 135, he says, the phrase prima facie duty must be apologized for, since number one, it suggests that what we are speaking of is a certain kind of duty, whereas it is in fact not a duty, but something related in a special way to duty. Strictly speaking, we want not a phrase in which duty is qualified by an adjective, but by a separate noun. And two, he says, prima facie suggests that one is speaking only of an appearance which a moral situation presents at first sight, and which may turn out to be illusory. Whereas what I am speaking of is an objective fact involved in the nature of the situation, or more strictly in an element of its nature, though not as duty proper does, arriving from its whole nature. 
right? And so he himself doesn't like the term prima facie, right? He, he doesn't want to suggest, oh, look, all duties, they sort of look like you're, they're your duty at first, but then they turn out not to be. He's like, no, 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 these are all things that just plain are your duties. It's just that they're not your whole duty there. They don't reflect the whole situation, right? Uh, and so he, this is how he uses the term prima facie, but, but he doesn't really mean what the word prima facie or the phrase prima facie really means. Uh, a more appropriate term uh, would be the term pro tanto, right? It's a, an, another Latin phrase. Um, a pro tanto duty is a duty that really is a duty, but that may conflict with and or be superseded by other duties, right? That, that's more or less exactly what he means based on what he says in this uh, in that paragraph where he says that uh, the term prima facie has to be apologized for. And so that's really what Ross uh, properly means when he says prima facie. So you know, why didn't he use the term pro tanto? It, it, the term must not just have occurred to him to use the term. Uh, it's not like he doesn't know enough classical languages. I mean, he's, uh, his, his, his original training was in classics. Uh, he was he knows better Latin than I do, certainly. Um, but for whatever reason, um, he just sort of apologized for the term prima facie and, and continued to use it anyway, when, strictly speaking, the more proper term is pro tanto. So the, the point here, though, is just to say that when he says a prima facie duty, what he means is a kind of duty that, that, that really is your duty. You do have some moral obligation toward that, but that that may not be the whole picture, like that there may be some other duty that is more commanding on you in a particular situation. So that's what he wants to talk about or, or when duties conflict with each other. And remember, for Kant, duties can't conflict with each other because there's only one duty, right? Um, and, uh, and, and that duty is absolute. Uh, Ross says, well, there are lots of duties. They absolutely conflict with each other and none of them are absolute, right? Some of them may uh, override others at any given time. Uh, let's talk about some examples uh, of, of some of this, right? So uh, Ross is going to maintain there's a whole variety of duties, okay? He's going to eventually provide us with a short list of those duties uh, that's not intended to be exhaustive, right? He's not intending to say, look, here are all of your duties. I know what they all are. Uh, but he does, he wants to provide a sketch of the kind of thing that he means. I think he does a pretty good job. Uh, the kinds of duties he identifies are, are very plausible and I think uh, very nearly exhaustive. Um, and the, the duties that he, he provides are broken up into a couple of categories, right? They're uh, broken up into first duties that we owe to ourselves versus duties that we owe to others. And so duties that we owe to ourselves, uh, we can call these the duties of prudence if we want a nice uh, fun name for them. He doesn't give them this name, but that's, that's, what, that's what this means. And so the duties of prudence are the duties of, of self-improvement, right? Uh, these are things that he mentions, uh, physical, mental, moral self-improvement. Uh, now notice the duty of prudence is not a duty to do what you want, it's a duty to do what's actually best for you. It's, it's a duty to, to improve yourself, to do what is good for you, uh, which is not always the same thing as what you want, right? So that's certainly one thing to, to remember. So one duty we have, we have a duty of prudence. Of course, this isn't our only moral duty. That duty can be overridden by others. We also have duties to others. And some of those duties are based on past actions. Some examples of those uh, that are on his list, uh, he gives the duty of fidelity. That is the duty of keeping promises that we've made and maintaining personal relationships that we have entered into, right? Fidelity is another word for sort of loyalty or something like that. Uh, the idea is, you know, behaving in a trustworthy way. Now, the idea is that if you make a promise, right, then that's the, the thing that gives you the duty to to keep your promise is that you have made it, right? And so that's the sense in which it's based on a past action, right? If getting married to a person means you have certain duties toward them, the reason you have those duties is because of a fact about the past, that you married that person. Um, and sometimes, uh, for example, in a marriage ceremony, there are often formal oaths, promises, uh, things that are, uh, uh, that are made, but there are plenty of kinds of relationships where those promises are implicit, right? And so, for, for example, if you uh, decide to, you know, play a game with somebody, you have implicitly promised to follow the rules of the game to the best of your ability. Um, and so, you know, even though you don't sit down at a chessboard and say, oh, I promise to follow the rules here, uh, it's understood by both players that they will follow the rules, 
Uh, another duty based on a past action, he calls these duties of reparation, okay? And that is compensating for people for wrongs that we have done to them, right? So if you um, are, you know, say, say, say if you borrow something from your neighbor and are careless with it and break it, right? Uh, say a shovel or something like that. Uh, well, it seems that you owe them a new shovel. <laughs> you owe it to you owe it to them to replace their shovel. That's a kind of duty of reparation. And again, it's a duty based on a past action. There is a thing you did. There is a harm it caused, and now you have a duty to make good. Right. That's uh, a very basic kind of a moral duty. And again, these these seem again very very commonsensical. Um, and I think once you take his whole list in total, you'll look at them. In, and I think it's hard to find very many common situations where at least one of these duties doesn't appear to apply. So I, again, I think Ross has done a very good job, even though he's not trying to be exhaustive. I think he does a very good job of of being so. So the last of his action uh, of his duties based on past actions is the duty of gratitude. Right. That is uh, doing good to those who have done good to us. Right. Um, so, I mean, imagine somebody, you know, bakes you a nice plate of cookies for, for no real reason, just because they, you know, they, they think you would enjoy them and they give you the cookies. At the very least, don't you owe them something? Right. At least don't you owe it to them to say thank you. Right. And so, again, this is the sort of thing that, that is uh, uh, based on a, a past action of somebody else's, certainly in this case, but that can convey on. If somebody does you a good, it seems as if you owe them at least some gratitude. You at least owe them thanks, uh, perhaps even more. But there are also duties that we owe to others. They're not based on past actions, right? These are sort of static duties, as, as you might say, standing duties. There's the duty of beneficence, right? This is not benevolence. Benevolence is the duty of willing good. Beneficence is the duty of doing good, okay? And so it's the duty to help others in need when you can, right? And it seems like we do have such a duty. We do have a, a duty to, to do good. Um, and it doesn't come from any past action of ours. Uh, it's just the goodness of the action that, that, that causes its, uh, its dutifulness, right? Uh, there's also a duty of non-maleficence, okay? This is the duty to do no harm, uh, to do no ill, right? To do no evil. Uh, uh, this is a, a very standard duty, right? You know, uh, in fact, uh, 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 I believe it's uh, uh, Simon Blackburn, I think, is the author of, of, of a pretty famous, very short introduction to ethics. It's just called Be Good. <laughs> uh, and that's uh, that's the duty of beneficence. But you'd think somebody could also write a book called Don't Be Bad, right? Um, and uh, um, that's, uh, and I think uh, for a time, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was Google's corporate motto was supposed to be Don't Be Evil. Um, and uh, so that's the idea, right? Having a, a duty of non-maleficence. And then finally, there's a duty of justice. Uh, in other words, a kind of duty of fairness. Uh, the way that Ross describes it is sort of not withholding from people what they do deserve and uh, giving people what they in fact deserve, right? So that's uh, the idea is that whenever it's in your power to sort of uh, choose what benefits certain people and what harms certain people, uh, that you should always do so in a way that tries to take into account uh, what people sort of have earned or, or deserve in some sense. Uh, that is, uh, don't be unjust, right? Be just when you can, and don't be unjust. So these are the duties of justice. And again, these aren't based on past actions. These seem to be the sorts of things that any sort of morally um, aware person uh, would regard as their duties. And so uh, between all of those, between prudence, fidelity, reparation, gratitude, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, it seems like Ross does a very good job of at least covering the major categories of moral duty that we come across in, in our common moral lives. And so this is uh, uh, one of the things that one of the downsides of having many of these different moral duties is that sometimes they will conflict. And when those conflict, we have to have some way of determining which of those duties is more important. That was, which is our duty sans phrase. That is, which is not just our, our, our pro tanto duty, but what's our duty duty, which is the one that ends up coming out on top in any given uh, situation. And so the first thing to note is that there is not a fixed hierarchy of duties. Right. And so we can think of a couple of examples, one of which is, is paraphrased from one uh, that uh, from one that, that Ross himself gives. 
So imagine that you're going to go to a restaurant and you, uh, you know, you, 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 or you promise somebody to meet them for lunch at some restaurant. Okay. There's a promise, right? There's the duty of fidelity requires that you try and keep that promise. Uh, and on your way to lunch, you uh, end up uh, coming across a, a child drowning in a small pond, right? A small puddle really. And, uh, you know, you can wait out there very, very easily, save the child. And so again, it seems like your duty of beneficence uh, is, 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 absolutely incumbent upon you here. It's not that you just don't have a duty to keep a promise anymore. You really do. You still have the duty. It's just that in this case, it's superseded by a more important duty. In this case, the duty of, of beneficence. But you might imagine that the duty of beneficence might sometimes outweigh the duty of fidelity. Uh, so, for example, imagine that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, your child uh, needs, you know, ballerina slippers in order to take ballet and, you know, satisfy some, some dream of theirs or something or to take these ballet classes, right? Um, and, you know, imagine you, you, you're budgeted very tightly, right? To, you know, you're budgeted to the very penny and you've, you've, you've put aside exactly enough money for these ballerina slippers and you come across uh, sort of, you know, a broke traveler who's, you know, asking for, for money that, that may help them. Um, and so certainly... That's um, there's a conflict of duties here. Uh, this duty between beneficence to help this traveler and the duty of of of, of, of fidelity, right? To to you know keep your promise of buying your child their ballerina slippers. And I think in this case maybe you might say that the uh, the duty of of fidelity comes out ahead of the duty of beneficence. And so again, this is this is. This is very common for Ross. He said there is, there just is no set hierarchy. There, none of these duties uh, tend always to overcome any of the others. Although some, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, uh, tend to be more stringent than others. Uh, tend to have fewer exceptions than others. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, just as I was saying, uh, the duty to do no harm. Right, this duty of non-maleficence uh, tends to be more stringent than many of the others that we've listed. Uh, we seldom owe anything to ourselves or anybody that requires harming another person. Although, again, sometimes duties of justice require uh, harming others or certainly denying them benefits. Um, and uh, you know, again, sometimes they do, sometimes sometimes uh, they don't really seem to. And this is this is the difficulty of Ross's theory, uh, and it comes from its really most plausible uh, element, as as most moral theories. Most moral theories, uh, you've seen the, the the things that people like about them also tend to be the things that people object to about them. And so this, uh, uh, Ross's theory is a theory uh, that we can call an, a, a pluralist theory. This is a, a moral pluralist or value pluralist theory. And so uh, instead of having only one reason to act, right, for the utilitarian, it's maximizing pleasure. It's following the principle of utility. For the Kantian, the one reason to act is to act in accord with the categorical imperative. In Ross's theory, we have many reasons to act, some of which are more important in some contexts than others. This is what makes his theory a pluralist theory as opposed to what we call a monist theory, like utilitarianism or like Kant's moral theory. But unfortunately, Ross's system pays for its plausibility with its complexity and uncertainty. So what do you do when you have situations in which duties simply conflict with one another? Well, this is what Ross actually says. These are his exact words. Again, this is a very famous quote from Ross. He says, when I am in a situation, as I perhaps always am, in which more than one of these prima facie duties is incumbent upon me, what I have to do is study the situation as fully as I can until I form the considered opinion, it is never more, that in the circumstances one of them is more incumbent on me than any other. Then I am bound to think that to do this prima facie duty is my duty sans phrase in this situation, right? So his, his advice is when you come across a situation where you have more than one duty and you need to figure out which of those duties takes precedence, which is your duty sans phrase, it's not just your prima facie duty, it's your duty. Uh, then what you have to do is you have to study the situation as carefully as you can until you form the considered opinion of which of your duties is more incumbent. I mean, just listen to that as advice. It's okay, you know, so what do I do when duties conflict? He says, well, think about it really carefully and do what you think is best. 
I mean, does that, I mean, it sounds like some reasonable moral advice, but it doesn't sound like the sort of moral advice you should, you should get from an ethical theorist, right? Uh, surely he could, he can tell us more than that, uh, or, or give us some sort of, you know, rules of thumb or, or, or some, you know, some kind of a hierarchy or something. And, and he, he, he doesn't, right? And, and, uh, and not because he couldn't think to say anything better, but, but because this is just, this really is the way that his moral theory works. And so this sort of vagueness in terms of method, it, it's disturbing, but it's probably unavoidable in a pluralist theory because, of course, uh, I mean, again, the reason that Ross isn't going to give any single overriding moral principle is because he doesn't think there is one. If we came up with some ranking of duties that always applied, then whatever method we used to do our ranking would in fact be the single overriding principle, and then uh, one would be an ethical monist. And, and, you know, Ross is simply not a monist. He just doesn't think there is only one source of moral duty. And so he says, we're ju we just have to live with the fact that there are there is more than one source of moral duty, and that it will be unclear to us in many cases which of those duties is most most incumbent on us, and we just simply have to do the best that we can, right? And that's uh, it's a hard place to be put in uh, by an ethical theorist. But uh, you know, the reason he puts us there is because he thinks that's just the reality of the situation. And so, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to uh, W. D. Ross's theories and 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 to pluralism more generally, we'll discuss pluralism more generally the next time is uh, a, a, something about the way that, uh, I'd like to talk about something about the way that, the way that ethicists tend to think uh, about moral theories or the relationships between actions and moral theories uh, and the way that, uh, the way that people approach ethics, because there's a very deep divide uh, in, in ethics and ethical theory. And we're just starting to see it here when taking a look at Ross. This particular kind of a problem is called in other areas of philosophy, the problem of the criterion. Okay, And this is the name given to a very old and very per pervasive philosophical problem. There's a version of the problem of the criterion that can bedevil uh, virtually anything you ever do. Uh, this particular name, the problem of the criterion, is uh, a, a name for the problem given to it by a philosopher by the name of Roderick Chisholm. So if you want to Google it, you can look up Roderick Chisholm, the problem of the criterion, and probably find a very brief paper. It's a very short paper that explains the problem of the criterion and how it applies in so many different cases in so many different places. But uh, the way I like to explain the problem of the criterion is by uh, uh, giving you an example of where I sort of, you know, first came across it myself, uh, or, or at least knew that I came across it. Uh, uh, back in the day, uh, back when I was in graduate school, I was a grader for a course called Moral Issues in Computing Technology at the University of Kansas. Uh, it was taught by a, a very excellent uh, philosopher and teacher uh, by the name of uh, Dr. Richard George. And... Uh, one of the assignments in that course was an assignment to uh, consider the moral implications of replacing our current human jury system. That is, you get 12 people who sort of argue at each other, like like on 12 Angry Men, uh, about um, you know whether somebody is guilty or innocent after hearing all the evidence and then sort of have to you know, make some kind of more or less unanimous decision. So uh, the idea is to consider replacing that human jury system with a computerized jury system and to consider some of the implications, right? So on the one hand, you know, some of the kinds of things that might be good in this assignment would be to say, um, well, on the one hand, it seems like uh, we know that human juries have certain kinds of biases that we, we don't really like. Uh, for example, uh, you know, they, human juries might be swayed by how nice of a suit somebody's lawyer has, uh, you know, even though that really has nothing to do with the case, or how smooth a talker somebody's lawyer is, or in general, how, how good somebody's lawyer is when really that doesn't have anything to do with someone's actual guilt or innocence. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, we, we've you know, heard of juries being, being racist or sexist or, you know, various other kinds of, having various other kinds of destructive assumptions that can get in the way of the enforcement. Of, of good justice. Uh, and so there are many of these sorts of problems, and these are problems that presumably computers would not have, um, and, uh, you know, etc. However, it might be the case that even though computers don't have this sort of a problem, we at least sort of understand fundamentally the way that people work because we are a people, 
right? So if you're a people, you sort of understand the way that people think, the way that they work, and you understand how they're likely to make their decision and what they're likely to weigh and how they're likely to weigh it in making that decision. And so whatever uh, a system of justice is, it should probably be transparent, right? It should be it should be understandable to the people who are in the process. Whereas if you have a computer spinning out a verdict, it's very it's very likely that you know plaintiffs, defendants, prosecutors, defense attorneys, everybody involved uh, doesn't necessarily know why the computer's doing what it's doing, right? Or that may require some something of a specialist, and and maybe that's important to our system. In any case, right? When I was reading over these papers, one of the things that that people uh, uh, kept bringing up was they kept arguing about which of the two systems, whether the, the human system or the computer system, would be more accurate, and would say, okay, well, this system's more accurate because this, that, and the other thing, and that's why we should use it, or this system is not as accurate, so we shouldn't, et cetera. So it all, all, all the arguments seem to be about accuracy, and, and it started to occur to me that maybe there was a problem with that, that that was a, a problematic way to, to go about thinking about this, because, of course, accuracy in the case of a jury system means like if somebody actually did it, then an accurate system would find them guilty. And if somebody was not guilty of the crime, the, the, the whatever system it is, an accurate system would find them not guilty. So in order to know whether a system is accurate or not, one would have to know in advance whether the party was guilty or innocent. But if we knew which party was guilty or innocent, we wouldn't need the system. Right. And so there's this interesting circular problem where in order to have a a, a, a method, right? You have to have some certain cases. You have to have some, some. You have to know something, uh, which cases are true, which cases are false, and then you can test your method for telling you what's true and false. Or, uh, but, but in order to know what's true and false, it seems like you have to have a method, some way of determining what's true and false. And the question is, how do you test the method without knowing specific things that are true or false? If, and if you see the vicious circularity of this problem, you get some sense of how vicious the problem is. And it's certainly a problem uh, in, 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 again, many, many, many areas of philosophy. So when I came across this, I, I you know, I did something that was uh, uncharacteristically wise given, given my age at the time. Uh, I, I assumed that I wasn't the first person ever to come across this problem. And so I started looking around and I, I described it to a couple of people and say, oh, that sounds like the problem with the criterion. And so I looked it up and like, yep, that's the one. Um, and so then, you know, I didn't have to reinvent the wheel there. I got to sort of skip a lot of steps and, and go right to the right to the end there. And, and it's it just is a problem. And so the way that that problem manifests itself in ethics is in the problem of whether to start with an ethical theory and then use that theory to deduce the moral status of actions or to start with the moral status of actions and generalize a theory right this mirrors the way that uh, that chisholm approaches it he says uh, that if you're if you're talking about the problem of the criterion with respect to knowledge of what's true and false he says that there are methodists there's people who have a method for determining what's true and false and then use that method to try and determine particular cases or you have people who are as he calls them particularists uh, where you say well you can start with particular things that you know to be true or false and then you can use those things to try and develop a method Right. And, and ethics can do it in the same way. We can use uh, the moral status of, of certain acts for particular uh, of particular acts and then use that to try and generate a theory. It says, all right, here's what we know. And what can we sort of what do those things have in common? What are all the things that we think are immoral have in common? What are the things we think are morally acceptable have in common? And then you generate a theory from that. Or you can sort of generate a theory, right, saying, OK, what you know, what kind of a good principle is there? Right. And 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 you know, what basis do we have for saying it's a good principle independent of specific actions, then what we do is we want to apply that thing uh, to the specific actions, right? So that's, it's a deep problem in ethics. And so monist theories, at least the ones we've covered in this course, tend to be Methodist in the sense, uh, in that, that in Chisholm's wording, in the sense that they start with a theory and then on that basis say things about actions, right? And most of them have the the most of them take the the point of view that if some particular act or some particular circumstance uh, it seems seems wrong or your your intuition says that that the action is wrong despite the theory saying it's right, 
uh, both of these thinkers, whether it be the utilitarian or Kant, will say, well, so much the worse for your intuitions. And we've even seen this. Uh, we've we've seen you know a, a case where utilitarianism might say, look, if doing what is as the best overall consequences is right, then it seems like we can imagine a situation in which something very unjust might have the best overall consequences, something like you know killing an innocent person. And so our intuitions tell us maybe that there's something wrong with utilitarianism. And generally, the utilitarian will respond, well, look, you know, when when your intuitions conflict with a good moral theory, so much the worse for your intuitions. You have to change the way that you think about uh, about certain cases. If we go all the way back to the trolley problem versus the doctor case, uh, the idea is if you want to say, look, utilities are important. What matters is how many people end up alive versus how many people end up dead at the end of the situation. What that means is that you simply have to change your mind about the doctor case. Right, you, you change your initial intuition. If rights are the most important thing, uh, that you know what matters is that you not violate anyone's rights, well, then you have to simply change your mind about how you initially felt about the trolley case. Right? And so again, all of these are, are very Methodist understandings, uh, in, in, again, in Chisholm's wording, they're, they're monist understandings of, of what to say about, about acts. Moral pluralist theories, and we'll see a couple, we'll see Ross's theory, we'll talk about pluralism more generally, and then we're going to talk about virtue ethics, which is another kind of pluralist theory of morality. They tend to be particularist in Chisholm's wording. That is, they tend to start with our individual moral intuitions and then try and generalize a kind of theory uh, based on those, right? Um, and so... Uh, the idea is that Ross says what you do is you think very carefully, right, about what kinds of situations you're actually in. Think very carefully about what your duties in those situations are and about why they're your duties. And then you can start to generalize, as he does, a kind of list, right? So, you know, based on all the, the common situations people find themselves in, we can kind of get a list of moral duties that, that do all apply, but, but some of them in some cases will be more stringent than others. And that's, he says, that's the most generalization he thinks you can really get. You're not going to, according to uh, uh, Ross, be able to generalize all the way to one single moral principle that really explains all of our individual moral intuitions. And so Ross tends to do this the other way. He says that when uh, a, a some some you know moral theory or you know single moral principle conflicts with your moral intuitions in particular cases, well, so much the worse for that moral theory. That must mean he says it's not a very good one. Um, now I I, I want to end up by saying that I don't. I don't think that there's a solution to the problem of the criterion, right? This is one of these kinds of problems that you simply have to acknowledge that it's a problem and acknowledge that there are different approaches to trying to solve it or, or really deal with it. Uh, one way of dealing with this problem in ethics is to adopt uh, essentially the, the Methodist framework is to say, well, look, when you have a moral theory, uh, a good moral theory, a good moral principle, and your intuitions conflict with it, so much the worse for your intuitions. But another way of going about this is to say that when your moral intuitions conflict with a, a moral principle, now yeah, so much the worse for that moral principle. And you'll in fact see both modes of argumentation in ethics. Uh, and what you'll want to do is want to take note of when you're seeing which one um, because that's going to be uh, what's going to be more important in this case. Uh, there's, it's, it's not clear uh, which of those uh, procedures is the better procedure. Uh, certainly, both both procedures have their defenders. Uh, they can't both be right, of course, uh, and that's one of the things that's very frustrating uh, about about the study of many things. But ethics is among those things. Is that there are lots of different views, and those views uh, really do all have something going for them. Uh, and even, but but among the strongest views, the views that have the most going for them, they just can't all be true, right? And so uh, here we have another view uh, of morality, a view that is different from utilitarianism and different from Kant's moral theory, uh, and that's the moral theory of W. D. Ross. And so we've seen that one difficulty that people have with Ross's moral theory is how hard it is to it is to, to apply it, right? There's all this difficulty. Says, and, and people think this is the biggest problem that people have with Ross's theory is that the best moral advice you can give us is, well, think really carefully about it and, and, and do what you think is best. Um, but of course, his uh, he has a reasonable response to this criticism. And I wanted to end by talking about his response to that criticism. 
And so uh, this is a, a, his, his response to this actually begins on the bottom of page 136. Um, uh, and he says that when deciding what the best moral theory is, right, that is whether you want to use utilitarianism or Kant's moral theory or even his own moral theory, really the only thing that you can do is, to put it in his words, study the situation as full as I can until I form the considered opinion, right, that one theory is better than another. And so uh, the criticism from utilitarianism says, well, look, if you're a utilitarian, you, you have a very clear idea of how to determine what the right thing is. You simply figure out which thing has the best overall consequences. Kant likewise has a very simple way of determining what the right thing to do is. He says, what is the what does the moral law require of you? Consult the categorical imperative and that will tell you what the moral law requires of you. And then you just do that. Uh, and so both of those things sound very simple, but of course th they sort of take their own positions for granted. What Ross, I think, correctly points out here is that if we're trying to decide what's the best moral theory to begin with, we're left in the same position that he thinks we're always in, in a position of simply having to study the situations as, as carefully as we can and then form the considered opinion it is never more that one thing is better than another. Uh, so again, I think this is a very reasonable uh, thing for, for Ross to say here, uh, is that the kind of, the, the appeal that our monist moral theories have, that, that utilitarianism has and that Kant has, these are appeals to our moral intuitions, right? And he says, you know, that, that if you make a different kind of appeal, right, that, that perhaps you can do uh, somewhat better. And that's why he proposes uh, the theory that he proposes. Uh, but I think he's quite correct that, um, uh, that uh, the, this is not this is not a fatal difficulty for his view, although it is a difficulty for his view. Like many of the other moral objections we've been seeing, they are legitimate troubles, uh, but they aren't the kind of troubles that there is no reasonable response to.